This is going to be part of our series on going through the Bible and taking notes. I'm going to show you how I take notes in my Bible. And this is going to be the book of Revelation. Uh, last time we did a topic. Now we're just going to pick a book of the Bible and start going through it, looking at a verse and a word and seeing if we can get some references on it to write down in our Bible. And you'll notice that I took a word from the verse, I write down the word, and then I write the verses. It's just easier for me to navigate. Like if I go to the verse and I want to I want to look at that word, I just look at what I wrote down. I've already got the word written down and then the references right after that. So that's how I do it. A person doesn't have to do it exactly like that. You could just write the verses it would save you room that way, or you could write a little letter next to the word and then put the letter in the margin and then the verses. That might save you some time, but for me personally, uh, I like to put the word and then the verses that go along with it. And so the first word there, we'll, we'll look at the words and then we'll look at the verses. And then you can write these down. You can Pause the screen if it goes too fast and write all these down in your Bible or on a notebook or something. But I'm just going to look at the words. Or we'll look at the references I've wrote down. So, Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's look at that word, Revelation. Okay, the first one I've got wrote down in is Romans 2.5. So if you go to Romans 2.5, it says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So I believe that that revelation there, this book has to do with wrath and judgment from God. And that's what you're going to read about through this entire book is about wrath and judgment of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ has to do with primarily with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and things leading up to that. All right, now the next one, 1 Peter 1.13. If you go to 1 Peter 1.13, it says... Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, notice it says, hope to the end. Alright, 2 Thessalonians 1.7. If you want to look at 2 Thessalonians 1.7. It says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's the revelation of Jesus Christ. When uh, Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, he's going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what John is going to be telling you about, the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sit and sent and signified it unto his angel by his servant John. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So you see, uh, God giving these things to Jesus, Jesus giving it to the angel and then to John. That's the way I read that. Some people read it a little bit differently and they make the hymn to be John. But I see that the hymn there is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's giving it to his angel. The angel's giving it to John. So it calls, uh, it, says, it says for John to give it to his servants. So let's look at that word servants. Now, you're obviously a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But this book is primarily about the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. 
And who does the Bible call servants? Look at Levit Leviticus 25, 55. Okay, Leviticus 25 and verse 55. It says, For unto me, unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Israel are called servants. And this book, doctrinally, primarily, is for the children of Israel. And of course, there's doctrine in it for us. And we can get things out of it. But primarily, this book is directed to another group of people. Because we're not going to be around for a good portion of the event, hardly any of the events in this book. Now, Luke one fifty four. Go to Luke one fifty four. He says, He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. So once again, Israel is called a servant. Now, he calls John a servant. So John is a servant. He's in the church age right there. You're a servant. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, the apostle Paul calls himself a servant. In Philippians 2.7, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is a servant. Hebrews 3, 5, Moses is a servant. In James 1, 1, James calls himself a servant. And in 2 Peter 1, 1, Peter calls himself a servant. And then in Jude, verse 1, Jude calls himself a servant. So you're better off to call yourself a servant and not pretend to be something you're not. Don't think yourself to be something when you're nothing. If you're right with God, then you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we forgot to look at the word shortly. Or I forgot to. Look at the word shortly there. Okay, if John wrote this 2,000 years ago, and he's saying these things will shortly come to pass, then that doesn't seem right. But you're wrong because this is the word of God, and it's always right. It's... It's going to shortly come to pass. So how is it going to shortly come to pass? Well, look at 2 Peter 3.8. I'm going to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So if a one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, then, in the mind of God, this was only two days ago when John wrote this. So it's going to shortly come to pass. Shortly. That's, that's how I see that. It must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And uh, if you've got the Common Man's Reference Bible, I like his note on that where it says signified. Uh, he talks about how John signifies it by using like or as. He uses similitudes to teach people things, explain to people things. Because you see, uh, throughout the book of Revelation, he's got many things that's going to happen. It's going to have futuristic stuff. And the only way he would be able to get somebody from, somebody who read it in the 1600s to understand it, would be to uh, use like or as because he's not going to be able... because he's looking at the future, even beyond us. So it'd be hard for him to write down what he saw in the future where people from 100 years ago could even understand it. So he uses similitudes. He uses like or as. But yeah, David Hoffman has a good note on that in the Common Man's Reference Bible. That's one of the reasons I like it so much. Not just that, but the wide margins and the... You know, it's got all the references in the middle there for you already. So, in the meantime, before you get all the references in there for yourself, you still got all his to go by. And I mean, a lot of people say, well, you shouldn't get a, a study Bible or a reference Bible. You need to get one with just, just the plain Bible and make your own notes. Well, that's what we're doing. We're making our own notes. We're, 
I went through and I do every time I do a verse by verse study, I go through myself, I get the words and I look those up in the Bible. And then, you know, I'll go through, I'll listen to some, some commentaries and everything else on it. But see, you don't just want to do it by yourself. That's actually dangerous because you can, you know, you want to be, have a multitude of counselors, you see, to, to get their views and ideas and opinions because, you know, you're, you could be wrong too. It's like a lot of people think, well, they could, they're the only ones that could be right and you have to write off everything else. You know, if they could be wrong, then I could be wrong. So I want to study it for myself first, sure. But then I want to see what other people say. That way I know I'm not being led off astray somewhere. But this is just the first verse so far. And we've already looked at so many different references here. Now, let's just look at John. Who's John? John is an apostle. And John 13, 23, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John 19, 26, he's the disciple whom Jesus loved that Jesus trusted with his mother after he was gone. You know, when he's down on the cross, he says, Behold, this is thy mother. And he points to his mother standing next to John there. So he trusts John with his mother. Would you, would, uh, would the Lord Jesus Christ trust you with his mother? Think about that. You want to be somebody that's a good enough saint that the Lord would trust you with his mother to take care of his mother. And then Matthew 4.21. Matthew 4.21 It says, And going on from thence he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. So John, the person that's writing this book of the Bible, is the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, and he's a fisherman. He was just a regular old person, a fisherman, not some great scholar or anything like that. And that's who's writing this book of the Bible that's just stunned the minds of many people. The smartest people in the world can't completely figure out the book of Revelation. Even though it's not a very hard book. But a, a simple fisherman, with the help of God, wrote the book of Revelation that's uh, caused many people to spend hours and nights and years on just one verse of it but it says who bear record of the word of god and of the test of the testimony of jesus christ of all things that he saw so he bear record of the word so let's look at that word word how did john what happened how did john bear record of the word of god and what happened when he did look at revelation chapter 1 and verse 9 it says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John bare record of the word of God so much that he was put in exile because of it. He, When he's writing the book of Revelation, he's on the isle that is called Patmos. I mean, that's suffering for the word. He bear record of the word of God that they took him away. They wouldn't let him be free. So, are you, do you uh, love the word so much? Do you bear record for the word so much that you would risk being put in exile for it? Now, Revelation 6, 9. Turn to Revelation 6 and verse 9. And it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So there's going to be people in the tribulation who believe the word of God so much and loved it so much that they are going to be slain for the word of God. Do you love the word of God that much? Do you believe it that much? All right, now, Revelation 20 and verse 4. 
Turn to Revelation 20 and verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. So there are going to be souls who are beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God. They believe the word so much, love the word so much, that when they got a sword to their neck, they're not going to deny the word of God. They're going to be beheaded for it. And John, he loved it that much. He would have been beheaded before he would have denied it. Now, Back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So the testimony of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, Revelation 12, 17. Look at Revelation 12 and verse 17. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. If you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, then you can say that you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to heaven for that reason. You can literally tell your own future if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And you know why? Look at Revelation 19.10. In Revelation 19.10, it's going to tell you what the testimony of Jesus Christ is. It says in Revelation 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What's prophecy? Prophecy, you're telling the future. If you have the testimony of Jesus, you can tell the future. Because if you've been born again, if you have the testimony that you're saved, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can confidently say that your future is a home in heaven and it's not in everlasting flames in hell. So, you see, you can tell the future, but you have to get it from the words of God. You can't just say, well, I dreamed last night that this was going to happen today or things like that. God doesn't operate that way anymore. Everything that we get, we get from the Word of God. So the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. See, the Bible will mostly tell you what it means itself. You just search it. Just search the Word throughout the Bible. That's what we're doing. We're studying the Bible, seeing what the Bible says about the Bible. So back to Revelation there. Okay, we looked at word, we look at testimony. Now, look at Revelation 1, 2. Okay, Revelation 1, and verse 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So he literally sees it. John literally sees what he's writing. So God literally basically puts him in a time machine he's the one of the first time travelers and he goes forward and sees the events of the rapture events leading up to the rapture the tribulation the millennium the great white throne judgment the judgment seat of christ all the all the the end time events he sees them all and if you look at that word saw just in the book of revelation it appears 42 times in the book of Revelation. John saw a lot of things with his own two eyes. He, did, he didn't just believe because he had faith. He believed it because he saw it with his own two eyes. He operated by faith and by sight. And I couldn't even write all the, the verses down that says the word saw in the book of Revelation. So I just wrote 42 times in Revelation. It's in 40 verses but appears 42 times. So, that's what this book is. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's what the Lord gave to John using his angel. And he's writing what he sees. 
Okay. Verse 3. Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he that readeth. So blessed. Let's look up at that verse. Psalms 1, 1 is the one I use for this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. If you are in the word of God, if your delight's in the law of the Lord, and in that you meditate day and night, you are going to be blessed. You're going to be happy. And Revelation 1, 3 says, Blessed is he that readeth. If you read this book, specifically Revelation, and you're saved, you're going to be happy because, <clears throat> I mean, it's got a lot of scary things in it, but you win in the end because you're on the Lord's side. So blessed is he that readeth. And here's a great one, that word readeth. What does the Bible say about reading? Isaiah 34, 16, one of my favorite verses, and you probably already know what it is because I say it all the time. Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Find the word of God, if you ain't got one, the King James Bible, and read it. How much reading are you doing? Are you spending all your time on Netflix and other things? Are you going to read the Bible? 1 Timothy 4, 13 is another good one I like to use. He says, Till I come, give attendance to reading to exhortation, to doctrine. So we need to be doing some reading. And here's another really good one. Deuteronomy 17. If you want to show somebody why they should read the Bible, here you go. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law and a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So there you go. There is scripture reason why you should be a daily Bible reader. He shall read therein all the days of his life. And he wrote it down first. He wrote a copy of it first. I'm, I'm convinced I should write the Word of God down. Spend time to get a pen or a pencil and write down what the words. And I like to do that. So that's the word readeth. Okay, what about this next word? Revelation 1. Go back to Revelation. Revelation 1 and verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So here. What about that word here? Mark 4.23. If you go to Mark 4.23. Jesus said himself, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That's one of the Lord's favorite sayings, and that's what he says in Revelation. He says the same thing in Revelation to the seven churches. In Revelation 2.7. 11, 17, 20, and 29, he's telling those churches, if you've got ears to hear, then hear is what he's telling them. He says the same thing in 3, 6, 13, and 22. He's looking for somebody that's going to open their ears and hear what he has to say. When you read the Word of God, are you just reading it because it's a, it's a daily goal? Sure, we, we have daily goals we want to do, but you want to make sure when you're reading the Word of God that you're hearing what's being said. You're paying attention to it. You're listening. You're taking into consideration what it says and applying it to your life. Okay, now the next word. This is a good one. The word keep. Look at Revelation 1-3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. So let's look at this thing about keeping the word. Deuteronomy 4.2. Look at Deuteronomy 4 if, and verse 2. If someone was to ask you how do you keep it, it says in Deuteronomy 4.2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you, keep. 
keep the commandments. Don't add to them. You can change what God says by adding to the words. You can change what God says by diminishing from it. That's a great verse against changing the word of God. And that's why I put it there next to keeping the words of God. Okay, Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Turn to Proverbs ch chapter 30 and verse 6. It says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So all these people who's taken the word of God and adding words to it, they're found a liar. And Paul said himself, Let God be true, but every man a liar. Okay, what's the next one? Revelation twenty two nineteen. Revelation twenty two nineteen. And if any man shall take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So don't take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Next one. We're going to look at is Psalms 12, 6 through 7. And this will explain to you why the words of God are good and why you should keep the words. Psalms 12, 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them. You keep them. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from his genera this generation for forever. So if the Lord's keeping them, then why aren't you keeping them? If the Lord's preserving his words, then why don't you believe that he preserved them? Why don't you believe that he kept them spotless, clean, without error, all the way up into this time that you're in now? So that's another good one. And then 2 Corinthians 2.17 shows you that there are people that do not keep the words. Paul says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So Paul lets us know that there are people who corrupt the words, but he says he's sincere. He wants you to be sincere. Are you sincere, Bible believer, or are you trying to change the words to what you want them to say? Okay, now, 2 Corinthians 4.2. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2 is another one I have wrote down. He, it says, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You don't want to handle the word of God deceitfully. You don't want to try to change it to make it teach what you already believe. You want to be change your beliefs to fit the Bible. So if you've got all those verses written down there, you can show somebody... You can turn to this verse in your Bible and show them all these verses to convince them why they should believe the words of God and not change it. And the next one is John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And then in John 14, 24, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine but the Father's which sent me. So, Jesus says, if you love him, you'll keep his words. All right, now, Revelation 1 and verse 4. Let's look at Revelation 1 and verse 4. Okay, this word grace. First, let's read the verse. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you in peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne so grace let's look at that word and let's look at second peter three eighteen. it says but grow in grace and in knowledge of our lord and in the knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So, growing in grace has to do with getting knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? You do that by reading the Bible and you do that by talking to him. So, that's how you grow in grace after you're saved. See, you had grace that allowed you to be saved. God giving you something you don't deserve. And then you have a daily grace, a daily growth of grace. Now, look at Second Peter 1, 2. 
It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you, unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The more knowledge you get about God, the more grace and peace that you're going to have. Now, the word peace, Philippians 4, 7, the one I like to always use for that. See, when you get saved, you get peace with God. And then after you get saved and you start living right, reading the Bible, praying, doing what you're supposed to do, you get the peace of God. And Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So that's the word peace. Now, this, where it says, from him which is, which was, and which is to come. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, but what does that mean? Okay, where it says which is, look at Revelation 118, and I'll show you what that means according to the Bible. So, from him which is, because in Revelation 118 it says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So it's from him which is, because he is, he's alive, he's not dead. He's not like other gods. Jesus Christ is alive and well, he's been resurrected. So from him which is, and which was, that I, I got John 1.1 1, 1 wrote there, because it says, in the beginning was the word. He's always been here. From him which is, and which was, he's from eternity past, he lives now. And which is to come, and I got Revelation 1-7 wrote for that, which says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. So this, what you're getting here is from him which is, he's alive right now, which was, he's always been here in the past, and which is to come, he's coming back. Now the seven spirits. What is the Bible called? The seven spirits. And the Bible defines itself once again. Those seven spirits are in Revelation 4, 5. And it says, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne are the seven spirits of God. But what specifically are they? What specifically are these seven spirits of God? <clears throat> now, God is one spirit. But look at Isaiah 11, 2. And I mean, I don't know this for sure, but this is, you know, the common teaching on this verse is the, what the seven spirits are. It says in Isaiah 11, 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom, wisdom understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So if you count those where it says in the spirit of the Lord with the rest of those in the verse, it comes out to seven. And that's what I have wrote down. I mean, I'm not 100% sure what it means by the seven spirits of God. I've heard what the commentators say on it, but I, I'm not 100% convinced that they're right all the time. But that's what I have wrote down. I have where it's, in Revelation 4, 5, it says it's the seven, the seven lamps are the seven spirits. And I got it wrote down, Isaiah 11, 2, that talks about seven spirits there. So that's what I have wrote down on that. So let's look at that next one, throne. This is a good one. Let's look at God's throne. And there's a lot of good ones in Psalms. So look at Psalms 9, 7. Go all the way back to Psalms. 9, 7. It says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. So it's a throne of judgment. All right, uh, Psalms 11, 4. Psalms 11, 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. So the Lord's throne is in heaven. He's the most high. All right, Psalms. Forty-five, six. In Psalms forty-five, six, 
It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. So the, the throne of God is forever and ever. It's never going away. You know how long you're going to be saved? Until the day God dies. And he's never going to die because his throne is forever and ever. Alright, Psalms 47, 8. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. So it's a holy throne. It's a throne of judgment. It's a holy throne. It's a throne in heaven. And it's a throne that's going to go on forever and ever. Alright, Psalms 93, 2. In Psalms 93, 2, it says, Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. It's a throne that's always been here. Always been here and always will be. And I mean, it's not talking about specific, necessarily a physical throne, but it's talking about the Lord as king. And he's sitting on a throne in heaven. And he's always been king and he's always going to be king. That's why his throne is established of old, the art from everlasting. As far back as it's ever been, he was king. And as far into the future as you can go, which is goes on and on and on and into eternity, he's king. So that's the Lord's throne. Oh, there's one more. The book of Daniel. I really like this verse. Daniel 7, 9. I just love how it's written. So turn to Daniel 7, 9. And it says, I beheld to the, the, the thrones were cast down. All the other kings are cast down. And the Ancient of Days, that's the Lord, did sit. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. So his throne was like the fiery flame. That's a cool verse. So that's the Lord's throne. All right, now let's look at verse 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Okay, faithful. My favorite one for that one it says, Jesus is the faithful witness. Look at Revelation 19.11. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. This is when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He's called faithful and true. He told them he's coming back, and now look, he's coming back. He's faithful and true. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. It says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Everything that God's told you he's going to do, he's going to do it because he's faithful. He's faithful and true. So the faithful witness, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's the first begotten. So let's look at that phrase, first begotten. Look at Colossians 1.15. If you look at Colossians 1.15, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? And then Colossians 1.18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So what does that mean? first begotten of the dead there in the book of Revelation Ch uh, chapter 1 and verse 5 where it says that from Jesus Christ who is the faith faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead when it says that that's talking to, it means how Jesus Christ he died, see, he died on the cross for our sins he was buried and resurrected and he is the first one who resurrected to never die again he's the first begotten of the dead and see if you die you're going to be resurrected to never die again. You're going to get a new body. There's going to be people who die in the tribulation. And they're resurrected to never die again. But Jesus is the first one that that happened to. He's the first begotten of the dead. He died but rose again to never die again. So you have all these other characters in the Bible. Like Lazarus, uh, Moses, 
people like that who died, but they died again. They die again. But Jesus is the one, the first one, to die and then resurrect to never die again. He's the first begotten of the dead. So it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But it calls him, also calls him the prince of the kings of the earth. So let's look at that word prince. So he's the prince of the kings of the earth. That means... He's over all the kings of the earth. He's prince over them. So Acts 3.15, it calls Jesus the prince of life. It says, And killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. All right, now Acts 5.13. Sorry, not Acts 5.13, Acts 5.31. It says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So he's a prince and a savior. And he's been exalted by God himself. Now, <clears throat> I had to come down and write on the bottom because I couldn't, I couldn't fill up all the... I couldn't fill all the references in there in the side margin. So if you run out of room, just come down to the bottom and write them. And in, in this regular wide margin Bible, I didn't have to do it as much because I didn't write as many references. And it was my second time writing it, so I wrote it a little bit better. But that's the good thing about having wide margins on all four sides. It says there, Unto him that loved us, in Ephesians 5.25, talks about how Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. In John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, those who ever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then that word washed in Revelation 1, 5, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 11 to see this word washed. So it gives this long list of sins and says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The blood of Jesus Christ washes you from sin. All right, Revelation 7, 14. It says in Revelation 7, 14, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So the blood of the Lord Jesus has cleansing power. So it says there in Revelation 1, 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And you've got to get, this is probably the most important one, blood, the blood of Jesus. You've got to have a whole bunch of verses on that so that you can explain to people why the blood of Jesus matters. Because there's a lot of people that say it's not the blood that matters, it was just his death. I've met people personally that told me that the blood just represents his death and it's not the blood that has saving power. But I'm going to show you in closing here that it does matter. It does have cleansing power. First one we're going to look at is Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the blood of Jesus is God's blood. It says God purchased the church with his own blood. It matters. It's God's blood. Romans 3.25 In Romans 3.25 it says, Whom God has set forth to be set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So faith in his blood, not just in, a, in his death, faith in his blood. All right, Romans 5, 9. In Romans 5, 9, it says, Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we're justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus. So how is that, how is it just his death? Ephesians 1, 7. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we have redemption through his blood. All right, the next one, Colossians 1.14, which is similar to the one that we just read. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's how you're getting your sins forgiven. Then Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. So that's how you get peace is through the blood. Peace with God is through the blood of Jesus. All right, Hebrews 9, 12. If you look at Hebrews 9, 12 through 14, it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's the blood of Christ that gets you access into heaven. All right, Hebrews 10.19. Hebrews 10, 19 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. All right, 1 Peter 18 through 19. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's the precious blood of Christ. Some, some guy said that Jesus' blood is no different than a dog's blood. But this called it precious blood of Christ. All right, 1 John 1, 7. And this shows you that the blood is still valuable to you even after you're saved. Still does some work in your life. It says, but if we walk in the light as, his in, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us from all sin. So it's got cleansing power. All right, Revelation 5.9. It says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So it's by his blood that he redeemed us to God. And then the last one, Revelation 12, 10 through 11. says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. So how do we overcome the wicked one, the devil, the accuser of the brethren? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So that's the blood of Jesus that you've been washed with. And that'll be all we do today. That was a lot of verses that we just went over. But I mean, this is how you get accompanied with God. This is how you, you labor in the Word. I mean, this is a lot of work. Looking up all these verses and writing them down it was it's very tedious i've probably put in 
just a couple hours looking up for these five verses here and then almost another hour going back over them, over them for this study here. I mean, this is what you call laboring in the Word. But, I mean, look how much information you have here at your fingertips when you do this. Just looking back over it, you, you could show somebody about the King James Bible, why you need to keep the words, why you need to read it. Uh, you can show them about the blood of Jesus Christ. You can show them about God's throne, about the fact that He's eternal and He's 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 alive today and He's coming again. You know, we've went over so many different doctrines just from looking up the words in these five verses. But I hope that you'll pause the video and write down all the all the references I've got here in your own Bible. Or if you've got a notebook you use, write them down in a notebook. That way, if somebody has a question on it, just turn to that page and you can give them the verses for each word and verse. So this has been Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 on taking notes in your Bible.